Hi everyone! Thank you for joining me this evening for my 
free webinar on how to land your dream job. I am having lots of success stories and I want to share um, some of the tips that I'm giving to my clients and I'll even talk about uh, some of the good news stories of those clients as well. Um, so I'll probably be about 30 minutes in going through this content, 30 to 40 minutes. And then if you do have any questions, I encourage you to just chuck them up on the um, comments board. And if I don't get to them while I'm covering that topic, I'm happy to cover them at the end in our Q&A session at the end. And yeah, today we're going to go uh, through topics like what resume tips um, will help you get noticed, interview skills um, that impress, um, being clear on what you're looking for, knowing your strengths, and where to find a job that's right for you. So I'll share lots of good resources and I have even more on my website. So I'll give you um, hints on where to find more details if it's not covered in this webinar. All right, so let's get started. I am <clears throat> going to talk about human voiced resumes. So one of the trends in the last few years is um, resumes have become quite boring. People are very time poor. And so if we can put just a little bit of human voice, um, and in other words, as if you're talking to a friend, into your profile statement, your resume objective that you have usually at the top of your resume or human voice in your cover letters, talking about who you are, um, a little bit about your passions. All of these things actually help you get noticed when you um, submit applications for jobs. Now, um, the definition of resume writing to capture attention is avoiding the zombie speak or the business jargon and actually using a more plain spoken descriptors of who you are and what your attributes or your strengths are. And so it's a bit of an art, I guess, to master that. A lot of people struggle with their resumes and they have me help them. Um, but there are a lot of examples of resume templates on my website. There's a free online career page and you can go and download. Um, there's one for IT, one for marketing, one for governance, like um, HR. Anyway, so there's quite a few and you can actually reuse some of the content if that helps you. So let me show you an example of a bad resume. Um, this is an actual client that I helped and she worked for a healthcare company as an IT person and she was very unhappy with the commute and the way that they were treating her and so she brought to me this resume. Now at first glance there's not, you wouldn't think there's a lot wrong with it but by us kind of doing a major over, overhaul of a resume it got her a couple interviews, got her a job, then she went on to get another job with it. So let me just point out some of the things that might get this um, resume less noticed. The first thing is people should no longer put their home address because people discriminate. The recruiters and HR folks will discriminate if they think that you don't want to commute as far. And let's face it, today is um, new with COVID. So the commute should no longer be an issue and people work from home all the time. So leave your home address off. That goes for everybody. Um, it's just not relevant anymore. And it helps you get noticed for jobs, even if they are a bit further from your home. So don't let them make that decision for you. Um, the next thing is she's got some overview of bullet points, but then she goes into the areas of expertise, then she goes into the technical, so it's just a bit too much, and it doesn't really describe her niche. So we really want to have kind of a, a human voice objective in the first section, then kind of a capability section with some stories of proof of having those capabilities, and then maybe a summary of technical platforms that she worked on or systems that she's worked on and then start the work history experience on page two because you only have six seconds to get their attention so if you haven't got their attention um, in in that they won't go on to page two and look at your work history now looking at her page two um, again not much wrong with it and i do like that she's covered achievements um, but it might be just a little bit wordy 
And so we really want to have metrics where we can in here about achievements. Sometimes you don't have those metrics. Maybe you improved, you improved employee morale by creating a new form or a new process. All of those things are achievements. So don't be afraid to list like promotions, acting chief information officer when required. Those are great things to showcase in your resume for each job. And also the number of achievements should correspond with the time frame that you're in the job. So if you had a job for only six months, then obviously you wouldn't have been able to achieve as much as if you had a job for six years. So just kind of um, correlate that as much as you can to the amount of achievements. But the biggest difference is you, um, from five years ago is the employers, they don't care as much about the responsibilities and achievements. They really want to see what achievements you did because most companies know what the duties of the job titles are. And then if we go on to page three, um, she did some other stints and she didn't necessarily list where the location of these jobs are and in australia it matters so tell them whether you're in new south wales or victoria or germany or um, overseas like th so all of those things are valuable and um see i do like that she had the job title next to the time frame that she worked at each job but if you leave out like if you just put year to year your resume will be thrown out if you um don't address the job gap particularly just recently if you haven't worked for six months or more you've got to list a reason for job gap so make sure you list covid or care for your loved one or your child all of those things are acceptable or that you were traveling um, but just explain that career gap and be as brief as possible and then she's got all of her education which is fine um, then we've got a whole other list of extracurricular classes which is great but then she's gone on to give even more technical hardware and software skills so that's probably better up front um, in kind of a table and let me show you the good example that's actually got her a couple of jobs since then. So we've summarized, um, sorry, we've done a human voice um, intro paragraph. We've summarized her capabilities and we've picked the most critical so it's not too much. And we've given proof statements um, that she's worked on 16 different platforms. Um, she's ported up to 50 changes per month per year. So all of those are really good metrics that people want to know when they're looking to see if you can handle the job that they're trying to fill. Um, yeah, and so she's just listed real life proof of each of those capabilities. Then she's listed a technical skill table and the career summary is really helpful in that six seconds if you have had quite a few jobs. And it's actually impressive when you have one employer and you've shown that you've had two or three job titles at that company. So don't, some people seem to co combine them in their resume. Don't do that. Show that you've had a progression and that shows that you got noticed at that employer and that you did, you performed well. Um, what else? So we, we kept the achievements. We, I think we just made them more, um, punchy statements. So we tried to shorten some of the bullets. Um, we did in her case split out the responsibility because she was application support. So there was a lot of things that she did as kind of the BAU, the business as usual responsibilities. Uh, and then, yeah, she listed the location of every job. You notice how it's very clean where she just lists the first three letters. I know it's pedantic, but the first three letters of the month and year and the um, same for the end. Um, even just little things like the fonts and the colors. So if someone's scanning your resume really quickly and they can scan all the employers in blue and they can scan all your job titles in black bold um, and all your achievements. So it's, it's actually uh, a bit uh, anal, I guess, but it's really helping people when they use my template and they're getting callbacks and getting interviews and getting jobs. And then this is a much neater way of listing all of her education and her courses, um, most recent to oldest, and then some of the volunteer work that we did. So we, we didn't try to include as much as she had in the first version. So yeah, so this resume has been very successful for her and she's referred other clients to me as well. And then I would like to show you a example of a cover letter. So people struggle with how to write a cover letter. So the question I get asked a lot is, should I customize my resume 
or my cover letter? And the answer is you should keep one version of your stable resume, maybe save a master copy, and you keep adding in the keywords into that resume so that it starts to become more attractive to different job advertisements. But the cover letter needs to be customized every time. And you can use this simple formula. So you write a human voice um, introduction and then you paste the bullet points from the job ad. So sometimes the job ads are really long. So you're going to pick three to five of the bullet points that you think, yep, I definitely meet that criteria. You're gonna put them in bold in the middle paragraph of this cover letter, and then you're gonna list proof or examples of how you meet that criteria. Um, and then just a very short, polite, closing to your cover letter, which maybe you can pull out something about the culture um, that was in the job advertisement and say this very much aligns with my values or my strengths, and that's it. Um, you don't have to put references. You don't have to repeat your email. The, the rule of thumb that I've found when I ask continually um, who reads cover letters, who does not, it's 50-50. And so if the job ad is asking for a cover letter, do it because you never know who on the other end, like even within a recruitment company, half the employees will say, I read the cover letters because it gives me a better idea of their personality and half of them say, I don't bother. So you just don't know um, who's gonna be reviewing your application. So if it is asking for a cover letter, you can um, submit that. The other thing you can do to get around it is call the company that's, um, and ask them, do they require a cover letter? And that helps get your name to the top of the pile uh, and they'll, might, they might pull up your resume if you've already submitted it um, or they might look for your application when it comes through. They might ask you to tell, you, tell them about yourself and what's your pay salary range. So be prepared for those two questions, but otherwise um, do a cover letter. I really recommend it. Okay, so now let's move on and close out the resume do's and don'ts, maximum four pages, maximum job history, 15 years, um, definitely explain job gaps, and there are a few reasons that are quite acceptable, so don't be uh, embarrassed or ashamed of that. 11 point font size is the easiest to read. If you're changing industries or job families, make sure you use that front page as a summary of all of your transferable skills that will appeal to the new employer um, and that you've given proof in, in stories. Um, also list achievements for all of your jobs, even if it was 10 years ago and you can't remember, come up with something. Maybe you, um, you know, received a award or a compliment from the boss, or maybe you got to do a rotation of shadowing with other departments. Any, all of these things matter. Save your master version of your resume and you just don't need to waste space on your resumes anymore with references or references available upon request. Don't bother. Um, most employers nowadays will have you do a successful interview. Then in the next phase, they will ask for references. I got a call today for a gentleman um, on that and he already had a great interview. And so that was part of their hiring process. They're about to give him a contract for the role. Um, don't show your home address. Don't attach a photo. The only exception is that if you're applying for a public relations job. Um, where they, they see you as the kind of front of the company. Uh, never include your date of birth. That's illegal for them to ask. Um, try to keep your bullet points short and sweet to a minimum. PhDs don't impress people in Australia. Doesn't mean you should hide it in your resume. You can still put it in the education, but they're more focused on your experience. And you never should ask for salary info um, at, on a resume, in writing, in the first interview. It just shouldn't come up. Um, don't show religion and don't choose a font like Times New Roman. That's just awful to read uh, many resumes using that font. So again, if you have any questions, chuck them up on the question board, but let's go on to interviews. So I've had, in just the last week, I've had a lady that went for a government job and she was advanced to the next stage. She called me and she said she was so glad that I asked her some curly questions that she didn't expect. I have an interview guide on my website that you can download a whole bunch of questions 
Um, and it was, tell me why we should hire you. And so she had an answer prepared for that. So interviews, practice, 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 and then it sounds less rehearsed. You're not as nervous, um, but it's your chance to make a great impression. And so if you can do a mock interview with someone, with me or with um, a friend, you can download my interview guide and have them do a rehearsal with you. Let's see. So I've got some tips for the interviews. The general question that a lot of employers start out with in the interview is to tell me about yourself. This is not your chance to kind of summarize your work history or recite your resume. Tell them something personal. I have three beautiful children. I love traveling. I love soccer. I'm a mad Manchester United fan. Like all of those things, just tell them a bit more about your personality and it's okay to be vulnerable and they will be delighted that you've given them something outside of the norm of other interviewees. Um, so tell them a bit about you, um, what you're passionate about, and you can also include work. You know, I used to live in Singapore. Um, that led me to do a career change into this um, field now, and I found that I really love it. So you can weave a bit of personal and business, but don't miss the opportunity to tell just a little bit of personal information about you, where you grew up, um, your kids. Um, I had an Italian girl who said she didn't love cheese. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so just make it a bit more uh, human. And then your strengths. You need to be ready if you are asked, what are your top strengths? And not just words of those strengths, proof of those strengths. So I'm very organized. I often arrange um, the work project plans um, or even the family events. Um, I'm very uh, analytical and I have a great deal uh, of attention to detail. In fact, I love spreadsheets. Uh, so give those terms, have, a, have those terms ready of what those strengths are and your weakness, um, which is generally the same as your strength, like analytical. Sometimes I belabor um, smaller decisions, but I've gotten better at that. So always say how you're correcting it as a weakness. Um, prepare your star stories. So star is a framework. Again, you can go on my website and watch video of the star framework, but it's how to respond to a behavioral interview question. So you start out with S for describing the situation, where you were working, what was your job title, um, the task, what was your assignment or responsibility, um, action, what was the action you took to solve the problem, and what was the result. And people often forget to say the result. All of this part of a storytelling should be no more than two minutes and you need to have star stories prepared. One example for teamwork, one for communication, one for technical if that relates to, you know, you're in engineering or um, IT, problem solving and even leadership. Everybody has leadership. You see a problem, you take initiative and then um, make sure that these stories are different. So. Theoretically, one story could lead, could be referenced for all of these examples, but you want to have more than one example so that it gives you more credibility. And then I often really coach people about having great questions at the end of your interview. So when they give you the opportunity to ask your questions, don't waste it on me, me, me questions. Ask them questions like, what are the top three challenges in this role? Or how do you like working here? Or what's the training that's provided um, for this role? What would you say about the culture? So all of these questions are bigger picture questions and it shows that you care about the company, not just about um, the desk that you would be doing. And so that is, I had one client that said he, the employer was so impressed that he asked this question. Do you have any reservations in me fulfilling the role? And so you get instant feedback. And I had a lady that asked that last week and they said, no, they had no reservations. That is a different lady. She's on her fourth interview. So I'm really hoping that she gets the job. So yeah, so make sure you ask some very thoughtful, um, smart questions and that can turn around a bad interview. Okay, and then let's move on from that. All right, so tips on Aussie culture. This was even new and something that I had to learn. Uh, you are your last job. So if you have a job in your most recent history that you wanna move away from, definitely put it on the second page of your resume and put all of the transferable skills that appeal to the new employer because they do box you in. 
Um, there's some other ways to get around that. Like you can also put that you were volunteering with somebody or doing work experience so that, um, or the last job may not match the job title. So be sure to put in parentheses what the actual job was that you were doing. Like maybe you were acting leader um, and you're going for a leadership role. So don't be afraid to actually, and HR and employers understand that you don't always do the job that matches your job title. So it's okay to list the accurate title, but in parentheses, the actual title. But just be conscious of that. When you take other opportunities, hopefully it relates to the career and the industry that you're targeting. And then credibility, providing proof. So it's just not good enough anymore to say, I'm a great team player, I'm motivated, I'm hard worker. All of those descriptors just don't matter unless you can provide stories that back them up. And the same with achievements. They want to know how you left that workplace better than you found it. Asking good questions and then persistence is a polite persistence. So I just had a client who um, he was trying to find a job. He moved here from another country. He, he had a major health issue. So that caused a major gap in his resume. And it took him quite a while to get interviews in the IT telecommunications industry. And when he came across a new recruiter, he called him every day and politely left him messages. And finally, the third day, the recruiter said, come in. And by the end of that week, he was off to an interview at a client and that's where he's working now. So don't be afraid to be persistent. Just don't ask them to call you back. You can say, I'm um, sorry I missed you and I'll give you a call next week or I'll give you a call in the next few days. So always leave it to yourself to get back to them. Same with emails or LinkedIn messages that you'll come back to them and try to find a time when they might be able to meet with you or call you. Um, so to wrap up the interview do's and don'ts, definitely dress up. I had a man, because there's a lot more webcam interviews happening right now, who the employer was Xerox interviewed him and they said, thank you so much for dressing up. He wore a suit. He didn't wear a tie, but he wore a suit and he looked sharp and he looked um, great for the interview. So the employer and the other manager at the interview were very happy he did that and come prepared with your star achievement stories. Research the company. When I was an HR director, we used to ask our candidates in recruitment, um, the recruiters and I would ask the candidates, what did you think of our website? And so you can tell right away if they did any research on the company. So make sure you can um, not only look up the company, the values, all these things, um, what services they provide, how many countries, but also um, the person, if you can do a bit of research on LinkedIn on them as well, that's interviewing you, that's always a bonus. Um, show self-awareness. You don't have to be good at all things. I find that some people try to be all things to everyone and it's okay. Like if, you, if you're asked, are you a big picture person or um, a, a details person, it's okay that you answer what your natural state is. Just hope that it's related to the job that you're applying for. Um, so be yourself. Yes, yes. Send a thank you note or an email, a LinkedIn message saying thank you so much for your time. So that has gotten people back into the consideration for a job because they responded so beautifully after they um, sent a thank you note or didn't get the job, but they said thank you for the opportunity to interview with you. So never underestimate the power of being polite and gracious. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at, don't forget to bring good thoughtful questions, the star pose to combat nervousness. If you watch the Olympics, there's a um, pose that the winners do when they cross the finish line. They do this star pose. And so it's actually been proven that chemically, if you go to the bathroom um, and stand in the bathroom stall before your interview, this helps relieve stress and help your brain chemistry. So if you are nervous, that is one way that you can combat that. Don't put your hands in your pockets if you're having a face-to-face -face interview in case they are doing handshakes and they are back to doing that in Australia. Um, and yeah, just breathe, deep, deep breathing is helpful as well. Um, and remember when you're asked any of the interview questions, try to keep your responses to two minutes. If you're going longer than that, you should be watching their body language. Are they looking at their watch, their paper, 
the clock on the wall, each other, um, that the interview panelists. Um, so make sure that you stop and say, am I answering your question? That gives them a chance to reframe and that shows that you have self-awareness. And don't be afraid to say just one time, sorry, I'm nervous. So if I had said that to you at the beginning of this webcam, I think you all would be quite um, patient with me if this was my first web webinar. So it's okay to say it, but just not repeatedly. All right, and then let's go on to knowing what you want. So sometimes people move here and they're just desperate to get any job. And actually that works against them when they're not clear on what roles they really wanna go for. So you have to know at least one or two roles that you would love to achieve. And if you don't, then at least be able to describe, you know, I want a job where I can work directly with customers, that I can work with an ethical company, um, and that I can uh, leverage all of my um, analytical skills. So be at least clear on what value you bring to the organization and know your limitations. So don't hide the gaps. Like, you know, my last employer, I, you know, had a hard time because he didn't let us work from home. And I found that I got a lot more done when I was able to work from home. So in this new company, I really would like to have more flexibility. So that's okay to say. Um, be aware of your eye contact. Um, some cultures, it's disrespectful to make direct eye contact all the time, but you need to work on that if that's you. Um, don't forget to smile. And don't forget that your posture matters. So if you're kind of slumped over, you do look less confident, um, less self-assured. And so that's part of the first impressions. And then no waffling, which means that you sometimes it's people that are nervous, but no wishy-washy answers um, that you're not really clear on what you're looking for or what you've done in the past. So just be clear on the responses that you will give. Confidence is important, but not arrogance, not overconfidence. Okay, and then how to convey passion. So I follow this lady on TikTok. Her name is JD O'Donnell, and she's a career coach like me in the US, and she gives all these one minute video tips. And I love that she and I were quite aligned on most things. And on the passion, you can convey passion by highlighting your strengths that actually match the job or the company. And so you can say, look, I've always loved tinkering around and taking things apart and putting them back together. And so that's why I love IT so much. And I find that at this company, they're trying new and different things and um, they're quite innovative and that's what appeals to me. So just in that statement, I've described like, what are my innate qualities that I bring to the table and why um, after all this time, I still love what I do and I love this industry. So that's kind of how you might uh, portray passion. Now in leading to that, there is a, uh, I'm a, a strengths tool that you can use. And I encourage lots of people to take the strength survey. Uh, it's an American tool, but it's in 35 or 40 languages. I'm a Gallup strengths accredited coach. And so you can go on my free advice page and you can find out about the survey and the costs. Um, it's very affordable. And it gives you your top five strengths. Um, and it gives you a language and in, in that give that allows you to describe it. So I have strengths like Relator and Woo. And so I use those every day when I work with people. And Woo, by the way, is winning others over. I have a slide in a second that has those strengths. Um, but I love meeting new people. And so just stating the strength and then a bit of an example um, after it, it gives credibility. Um, it tells the person that you're self-aware, that you're articulate. And so it's really important to know your strengths. You don't have to do the Gallup Strengths Survey online. You, there's other um, tools or places where you can go find those descriptors. Maybe you're humorous. Um, I helped one man write a resume and I knew how funny he was. And I wrote that into his resume objective that he brings humor to a stressed team and he got the job. So um, 
just know your strengths and be able to give little one line examples about them as well. Okay, so these are my top five strengths. So relater, good with people, regular checking in with my clients, positivity, always checking um, how was your day, uh, an arranger, it's very much a project manager strength that I love. Um, like right now I'm planning a, a winter getaway with all of our kids and my in-laws. And so I've um, gone on Airbnb, done the research. I've listed three places that meets all of our criteria. We have to have Wi-Fi. And um, it's a bit in the cold winter zone where we want to be. So anyway, I've asked the, um, the troops, there's 10 people to vote, which place do you want to stay at? So that's kind of just my natural um, organizing state. And then I'll book it, get everybody to pay their portion. Um, that's an arranger example. Responsibility is great work ethic. I hate letting people down. And then woo, I love talking to the Coles cashier or the bus driver or um, finding out how they're doing. So knowing your strengths is so valuable. It's confidence building. Um, if you can find a job that you can use your strengths every day, you're six times happier at work and you're three times happier at home. So I cannot stress this enough. Um, let me just show you, there are 34 strengths in this particular profiling tool that I've referred to. And there's four families of the strengths. There's the doers, the influencers, people that take charge. There's the relators that make the team greater than the sum of its parts. And there's the strategic thinkers that absorb and analyze information so that it can make better decisions. So I have my top 10 strengths are in all three of these areas. And I don't have any top 10 in my strategic thinking. However, I run a business. So I surround myself with strategic thinkers that help me run my business. And I've rolled out many strategies in my past lives at corporate. So it doesn't mean there's one proper formula. It just means we know who we are and what behaviors and talents we bring to the table. And then I want to talk about the iceberg analogy, and some of you may have already heard this, but if you are job seeking and all you're doing is looking at online job ads, you are going to miss opportunities. So I really encourage you um, to start doing some networking with people that you know. Now, what I mean by this, so 20, it's probably closer to 20% of jobs are advertised on, let's say, LinkedIn or Seek or Indeed right now. And those jobs are, um, there's hot, heavy competition. However, there are 70 to 80% of jobs that are found through who you know. And I'll give you an example. When I've listed my 13 jobs in my whole life, 11 of them were through who I knew. I was really surprised by that because um, I feel confident in interviews and I feel like I've got the right um, skills to go out and get a new job, but when I looked at that history, it quite very much backs up that statistic. And so what I mean by you should be doing networking is, you know, if you apply to a company and you see someone you know also works there, you should be dropping them a note. How are you doing? Hey, I saw this job advertisement. Can you tell me anything about the culture at the company? Um, would you be willing to have a coffee? You might meet someone at your kid's um, karate class. Strike up a conversation. It might come into, you know, after a series of conversations, you might say, hey, I'm looking for new work. These connections, they are all valuable at the hairdresser, at the gym, <laughs> people find jobs. So don't underestimate the power of just putting it out there in the universe that you're looking and be clear on what you're looking for. And people, humans, will inevitably want to help you. So make sure you're using LinkedIn, um, you're using your own network of people that you know, your family, and generally there are new opportunities that are discovered through that method. Okay, um, so that's kind of covering the iceberg analogy. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that many recruiters and HR employers are looking at your social media pages, particularly Facebook. So don't underestimate their ability to see that you might have images of you holding a wine glass or um, having a rant about politics or um, just anything controversial. 
take it off your social media pages because you don't want that to get in the way of you getting a job, particularly on your LinkedIn photos. Make sure they're very tasteful um, and that you have good uh, lighting, good background, and that you look very professional and you're smiling um, because people want to work with friendlier people. So if you're smiling, it makes you look more approachable. Um, the the LinkedIn is a great way to find people. I just found a for a client a couple weeks ago. I found a man that works at Macquarie Uni. My client wanted to find out about gaming and, and user experience research, and this person met with him, and now he's organizing work experience for him. So, LinkedIn is a beautiful tool if you can use it the right way. Just make sure that you um, always put a personal note when you send a LinkedIn request and that you um, tell them, you know, that you admired their profile. Uh, you would love a 30 minute chat with them or a 15 minute chat on Zoom if they were available to ask them advice about their career. And also um, Seek and Indeed are quite good websites to find uh, tradie jobs or hospitality jobs or um, I've seen lots of government jobs advertised there too. And then Facebook and Instagram, uh, Facebook's not so much you uh, advertise jobs. However, I see them a lot in the moms groups that I'm part of. I'm part of like five. And those um, posts do come in my feed that they're looking for someone. So every once in a while, I'll refer a client to a job need. Um, but Instagram, they are targeting the younger um, generation, the Gen Z and the millennials for job ads. So don't dismiss that. If you like a company that you really want to work for, follow them on all of their social media channels. They may be so big that they never have to advertise. And so that's the way you're going to find out about those jobs. Okay, so this is a list of websites that are lots of great resources of where to find the jobs. Um, this one I really like. This new one has come out in the last year or so. And it's a forum of companies that are ethical. So they believe in diversity in the workplace, equity in the workplace. And so it's great that they have now started posting jobs on that website. Um, I love Flex Careers and Beam because they post a lot of part-time jobs for moms. It started out for moms, but they're actually happy to hire men for those roles as well. So they're not excluding men. Um, and I also think Puffling is quite innovative. They do what they call a job sharing solution. So two people might want to work two or three days a week and they share a full-time job and Puffling helps them package that up and approach the employer with that possible solution. And let's see here. We talked a little bit about LinkedIn. So um, being active on LinkedIn is actually um, helps in your favor, especially when you like things. It goes into the other connections that you have into their feed. Um, it helps you get in touch again with people that maybe you went to school with or that you used to work with. And by the way, if you had great relationships of people that you hadn't seen for 10 years, 15 years, you're Memory is frozen in time, so don't feel bad that you haven't kept in touch with them. Do reach out, say hi, how are you, um, and just keep those uh, potential contacts warm. Uh, ask them you know, if they want to have a virtual coffee for a catch-up. So those things are all quite nice instead of just always wanting to ask them something and you haven't heard from them for, haven't spoken to them for a long time. You can also create a new network. You can create business intelligence. There's, I always watch a lot of the LinkedIn job seeker tips and I try to stay aligned with them with all of the tips from the experts. Um, so I'm happy to report there haven't been any contradictions. Um, it can help you find opportunities. It tells you how many other people applied for the job, which I really like. And it helps your, um, your skills and your opportunities will also find you. So there are in LinkedIn, there are premium memberships that I'd say 90% of the HR or recruitment teams pay LinkedIn for. So they may pay 10,000, 20, 50,000 a year, and that allows them, I guess, what I would call spy access. They can surf all behind the scenes and look at people's profiles, find people that match their criteria and approach them for jobs. I had a lady that happened to, she was a cyber security expert. She'd been on maternity leave for five years. She went into LinkedIn 
and turned on some of the settings that, you know, that she was going to start looking. And lo and behold, she got hired at Deloitte. So she did great. And so, yeah, you need, she never had to apply for the job because they found her and asked her if she was interested. These are some great TED Talks that I recommend. Um, this one um, is if you've had a bit of a career break. Uh, it's quite insightful for people that have been out of the industry for a while. Um, love this one for Sheryl Sandberg, why we have too few women leaders. Shocks pal how she was bossy as a girl and that was a negative label and now it's not so negative, which I love. Brene Brown, this one is, if you watch any of these four, this is the best one, The Power of Vulnerability. It used to be the most talked, a most viewed TED Talk. It's 20 minutes. It's all about um, taking risks and being vulnerable. And if you if you weren't vulnerable, you wouldn't choose your new partner. You wouldn't buy a house. You wouldn't move cities. You wouldn't have kids. Like all of these life decisions are so important for your growth. And so look at change and jobs and career um, in that manner. And then Amy Cuddy is the psychologist who talks about the star pose, um, which is very confidence building um, and calming uh, when you're nervous for an interview. So yeah, so those are some TED Talks. Now I'm going to go to ask if there are any questions. So I will pause for a moment and see if anybody wants to ask some personal um, situation questions for themselves if they are job seekers. Okay, good question. So I hate social media. Is LinkedIn really worth it? Um, I will say that there are a lot of teachers, I'd say like 50% of teachers don't have LinkedIn um, and lots of tradies or construction, plumbing, uh, electricians, they don't have LinkedIn. So it doesn't really benefit them. But if you're going for a professional job, then yes, it definitely is worth it. Um, it's worth it to have a great profile. And by the way, your application will be thrown out if your resume is submitted and it doesn't match your LinkedIn profile, like the work history has to match. So yes, it is very important. People do want to have a frame of reference to show that you are who you say you are, um, that you've got other connections on LinkedIn, gives you more credibility. Uh, you can even customize your LinkedIn URL, which I have instructions on my website as well, and that gives you more credibility too. So yes, um, it is worth it if you are targeting a professional office type job. What other questions would you have? Will employers always check LinkedIn? It's hard to say. Because if they have that premium membership as an employer, you will never know that they viewed your profile. It's hidden. You will never get an alert or a notification for that. So it's better to um, just assume that they will look at your profile. I just had another client last week who had a really outdated photo. So I was like, oh, I don't want to approach anyone until we've refreshed your photo. Because it kind of makes you dishonest if you have a photo from 10 years ago and you look very different um, it's a bit misrepresenting so just make sure that your your profile is up to date and assume that people will look at it without you knowing all right good questions Chris is it better to follow up post interview through LinkedIn or a phone call I would say LinkedIn a phone call is almost too um, pushy. However, if it's been a week um, and you haven't heard anything, then a phone call is okay. And if you catch them, they might go, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you called. Someone, um, one of the approvers went on um, unexpected leave, so we've had to put a hold on the job. So yeah, that, that would be okay. If you've waited at least a week, you haven't heard anything, you can call. But otherwise, you should send a message on, let's say you're 
interview was in the morning, you should have a thank you message sent out in the afternoon by LinkedIn or email. If your, e if your interview was in the afternoon, you should have a thank you message sent out via email or LinkedIn by the next morning. All right, come on guys, ask me questions. I'm here for you. No questions dumb. Okay, if I have a bad feeling about the interviewer, should I still follow up? That is a good question. I think you should trust your gut. There are probably signs that you noticed were, <clears throat> um, like I had one client who had a bait and switch situation. So we went in for like a junior marketing role and then they sat him down and they said, oh, you'd be great at sales. Come back on Monday and we'll start you out. And it was no, there was no job contract. Um, it was just very fishy. And so I told them, this is not a good situation. They should be above board. They should be willing to pay you for your expertise and your contribution. So yes, if you have a bad feeling about the interviewer, you can still follow up because it's good practice to get feedback, but wait till you get the offer to decide, is that something I want to take or not the job? Oh, and I had another young lady who went to a doctor's office. She was just applying for a Saturday admin job and the doctor made her wait an hour after he was seeing his patients and was falling behind. He then told her, oh, I didn't see that you're going to graduate soon with a nursing degree, so you're basically no good to me. But if you want to come back and get free um, Saturday experience, you can talk to my receptionist next week. So again, just shady shady things that employers should not be asking you to do if there's no benefit um, for you in the long term. Okay, good questions. Another one, are written or phone references as common these days or only if there are doubts? Um, it's, it's not common nowadays for people to come to an interview or even after the interview with written references. Um, however, I've done quite a few references in the last six months. Um, one was with Vodafone and it was an online app and it was one of my employees that used to work with me for me. And she was like my favorite all time employee. And the app came back and said, you've given her too many high marks. So I did change that, but I've seen the phone app today. I got a call for another client who, um, they asked me a series of, you know, 10 questions, what are this person's strengths or weaknesses? So that was all phone reference. I would say that is more common um, in Australia because they can get a feel over the phone if the person is genuine, if they are giving um, candid responses and actually offering insights into how they have operated and dealt with this person and how that person the, the candidate has behaved in certain situations. So it's kind of like a secondary interview. They ask you behavioral questions, but phone references are definitely more common these days. Good questions. Thank you, Mark. It's your morning in Germany. All right. Well, if there are any more questions, feel free to hop on my website, send me an email. I'm always happy to help. I also do free resume reviews. So you send me an, your resume and I'll do a, a video recording. It's no more than five minutes of just some feedback and tips. Um, and I usually give you resources to help you move to the better model or way to present yourself in the resume. Um, I do very quick, um, mock interviews with people that's usually like 45 minutes to an hour highly recommended if you haven't interviewed for a long time um yeah and then the strength survey i really recommend that for people so that you kind of have a way to brand yourself and then make that brand consistent on your linkedin on your resume cover letter and your interview um dialogue so I wish you all luck. Thank you for joining me this evening or this morning. And um, hopefully you might give me some good news. I love to hear from you if any of these tips helped you today and you landed a job. I'd be ecstatic. Bye for now.